we're gonna make some cyanotype paper today. I am on the floor, but that's where the paper's gonna be. This was just my opportunity to get down in front of the camera. Let's move our stuff in. So what are we looking at? We got everything we need to make a cyanotype right here. Today we're going to make cyanotype paper. This is 11 by 14 inch tall mixed media paper, which makes it really ideal for all sorts of things. All right. We also have a brush. This is what we're going to use to brush the actual cyanotype chemistry onto this paper. This is called a hake brush. And it's a name that I actually don't know what it means, but it basically means that there's no actual metal in it. And that's good because the metal can react with the chemistry we're using. So instead of like a metal binding, there's just hair and, and little bits of thread. So very useful. We've got a scale because we're going to mix some of the cyanotype chemistry. Turn that on. And we've got, well, we've got gloves, which why don't we put these on right now? That's rhetorical. Let's put these on right now. Okay. And we're wearing gloves for safety. These are chemicals. They can react with our skin if we're not paying enough attention to what we're doing. And uh, these gloves provide us a little bit of a leeway in that regard. Okay, we can take our gloves away now. And we can look at our two chemistries. These are the two things we need to make cyanotype work. It's a part A and part B solution. And we basically just mix both of these chemicals together into that bucket in equal parts. So I'll put, let's zero at the scale. And let's put how much of part A in? We'll just say 50. That's 50 grams. No, we'll say 100. We can afford it. If you're working from one of the kits that comes with pre-made uh, tubes of chemistry, you probably have close to 250 grams slash milliliters of chemistry in that. So I effectively just used about half of one of those vessels, just for comparison's sake. And we're gonna add exactly the same amount, so 102 grams to the, of the part B now. So this is a different piece of the chemistry. And I'm gonna zero out the scale, and we're gonna add it until it gets to 102 again. Hundred and three is just as good. In fact, it's one better. The precision of this won't matter. We're less than one percent of the way to, you know, making it exactly. So that's sufficient. We can put these away now. We can also put the scale away. It really is that easy to mix this chemistry. It's, it's just two things really. I'm gonna put the this piece of paper here so we can see our chemistry better. We'll also be able to see if we drip chemistry on it because look, it's white. Okay. We are going to take this piece of paper. There's, there's quite a few pages and we're going to coat cyanotype chemistry onto it. It's, it's a really straightforward process. And I, I'm gonna make it a little easier by first removing the page from its house. There we go. And let's just brush some of this chemistry on. You can see there's a lot of it on this, um, this brush, the hake brush. So I'm actually gonna kinda just try to get a little bit of that off because we don't necessarily want a puddle on the paper. We want something we can kinda move around and that will sit on the paper but won't, but will absorb into it. And that's what we've got here, basically. And I, I think the, the neat little textures that come from the brush are an added bonus. See that like 
bonus corner texture. That's just a nice little thing that you get when you don't use your hockey brush every day and it, it kind of mats up in good ways. Now, even though I said we weren't going to want to puddle on this paper, we effectively have a puddle on this paper. That's okay. It'll absorb whatever it can, and then it'll reach a saturation point, and then that chemistry will just sit on top of the paper. And eventually, it will either be exposed when you make the cyanotype, or it won't. In either case, it'll probably wash away. So this is acceptable in terms of kind of smoothness of coating. It's not ideal. I can see some mottling with a T that kind of makes it look a little thicker in some places than others. I don't mind that. I think it'll add some nice contrast and texture to the finished image. We can put this over here for now. Let it dry. There we go. And the actual color of these, let's Let's make sure we're fully focused here. Put this right there. Zoom right in. So you are helping me with this process by being patient as I figure out how to do it all myself. There we go. Okay. And let's also just make it, there we go. Got a little more to see now. Let's do another page because we sure got a lot of these. I mean, it, it seems like a lot right now. It's actually not that many. We're gonna wish we had more once we're out. All right, now this one is just gonna be, well, it's gonna be similar to the last one, but I'm gonna do this. Okay, and now I'm gonna do this, and that, and this, and that. And this, and that, and this, and that, and this, and that. I don't know if it's coming through yet, but there is no one way to make these papers. It's, it's about what you, what you feel like doing as you do it. I mean, in the end, you're just... <laughs> if this was water, you, you would just be brushing paper with water, and you would probably feel kind of strange, like, why am I doing this? because the water will evaporate and leave nothing on the paper, except maybe some lime and some trace elements. But this chemistry that we're coating, which is effectively similar to water, is full of possibility when we take this paper into the sunlight. The sunlight will cause this yellow paper to react and darken up. And the parts where the sunlight touches will become dark blue in the finished image once it's developed. And the parts where sunlight is kept from, so the parts that stay in the shadow the whole time, will stay the original color of the paper, which is white. And the result will look something like that. Sunlight, no sunlight, sunlight, etc. And that is the medium of cyanotype. And we're going to keep making some of these together. I'm going to put that one right there. This one right here. Let's do another one. I'm going to try to get this one so there's no excess on the paper, meaning we won't have little little puddles building up like we did with this one. And these brush strokes are kind of rough, and that's by design. The finished paper will reflect the nature of the brush strokes. Like we're we're gonna we're, we're painting these papers blue, kind of. Doesn't seem like it right now. It seems like we're painting them a light yellow green, but we're painting these papers blue, and then some parts of the blue will wash away, leaving white. And everywhere we're painting right now with the brush gives that part of the paper the ability to be blue. So technically, if we expose this whole sheet with nothing on it, everything that's not white would become dark blue. If I were to put my hand here for five minutes while it exposed to the sun, which you could see, I'm actually getting some sunlight right now, although it's, it's diffuse, it's kind of bouncing all over the room and whatever. If I were to hold my hand here in the sun for five minutes, 
This part that's yellow would turn dark blue when the finished product was developed, and the part underneath my hand that stayed in the shade would remain white. And we're just putting these images here for now. In this diffused light, it's okay. I think that was the right amount of cyanotype chemistry to put on that last paper. Didn't seem to have too much, too little. I like the ones with the white border on them because they look, they look pre-framed. So when this is a finished cyanotype and it's been developed, the white border around it makes it look like it's already been framed. Kind of like a white border print back when people used to print photographs out, they would, you know, you could go to the photo place and say, I want prints of these photos on this roll of film. And they'd say, do you want white borders too? And you could say, yes, those make my photos look so fancy and finished. When I worked at a photo lab, I got to suggest white borders for everybody. I feel they add a finishing touch to photos. You know, it gives you the idea that you can hold the edges without getting them all smudged. Same for this. We'll have a nice safe little edge which will allow us to interact with this. And that might make it a little more real and a little less precious. I say that in a way that I, I don't think preciousness is a quality I, I admire. I would rather something be useful and beautiful at the same time. Of course, I don't know what the use of cyanotypes are. I suppose the use is free creative energy expenditure. We'll do this one full page, so I'll go all the way to the edge. And they really are very different techniques when the finished product is, is done. Seeing a cyanotype with the white border around it versus seeing one that's full page, they're just night and day. They just give you, they give you the audience a very different sense of what the image is. I think there's comfort in a frame. I think there's freedom in the full paper. So pick which one you like more, comfort or freedom. There we go. Yeah, we have a lot of chemistry here, so we can... Oh, hey, we pre-tore that one off because these are all perforated. We got to just, when we took that out of the notebook, tear a little bit of that off. I usually leave this part, I call it the rebate, until the cyanotype has been developed. And then once it's done, if I feel the cyanotype is worthy, I will remove that border like this. And that will effectively, to me, psychologically signify that this cyanotype is done and ready for the world. You may notice I hadn't done it on this one before. I don't feel it is done and ready for the world. That's okay though. All right, let's put these, continuing to let these dry. You may notice there is light in this room. In fact, technically you may not notice that because we take that for granted if we're seeing things, there must be light. But the fact that there's light in this room means these are all slightly exposing to the sun right now, all of these pages. It's going to be a minimal amount of exposure. It's not going to do much. In fact, most, most indoor kind of light diffused exposures that cyanotype papers will get probably won't register on the finished cyanotype. But if I left them in here for several hours and I put, for example, this box on one of them, we would probably see some light blue on the finished cyanotype here with that being the unexposed part just because it had enough ambient light to absorb and undergo a chemical change and i actually sell these papers on a website called lightprintpaper.com so if you are looking at this and think that looks fun, I'd like to have this much fun, you can. Well, uh, the part you're watching now isn't actually the part that you would have fun doing. 
technically the next part, I think, is the most fun part. And that is the making of the cyanotype. But anyway, if you'd like to buy any of these pages, you can go to lightprintpaper.com and you can buy four pack, five pack. I'm not sure how I've configured them at any given moment, but they're all available. And you can have this much fun as you're as, on your own. You can also get this chemistry, obviously, and do this all yourself. Like these steps I took that I've shown you, you can do them right now. You can get this chemistry, you can get this hockey brush, you can have the fun I'm having. I think we'll, by the end of this, have a good mix of light color or light white bordered pages and regular full pages. I like them all. I think they all have their merits. Sometimes I find that I go a little too close to the edge on some of these papers, you know, because I'm actually, there's a perforated line that starts here. And so that means my actual border is closer. So kind of have to adjust the way I make these in that case. There we go. Okay, that's looking real nice. Let's take this one out. Boom, put that up here. Add another, ooh, we're getting, no, we still have quite a few pages. Do this one full page. I put a lot of chemistry on this paper. See how thick it is? It's kind of like, I mean, really, I, I am pushing a puddle around on this. Sometimes they call that uh, puddle pushing. If you use like a, another way you could be doing this is with a glass rod. And you can actually take a rod that's the length of this paper, put a, a bit of cyanotype chemistry here and just draw the rod back and forth across the paper. And that works. I don't do that. It looks, I don't want to involve glass any more than I have to in the work I'm doing. I used to do a type of photography where the photos were taken on glass. And that was, that was fun. One of the very first historical photographers for the United States was a photographer who shares my name as well as the way it's spelled with an E, Carlton, Carlton Watkins. He went around to the national parks at the request of the president at the time, Abraham Lincoln, and documented things like Yosemite and all the parks that we now have preserved He's, he basically took plates of glass that are, I would say they were about this big, probably 18 by 24. So imagine, imagine holding a plate of glass that's this big, carrying it with you up a national park. You probably have a donkey that's helping you carry this stuff. But then when you're ready to take a photo, you take that plate out, you sensitize it with all your light sensitive chemistry in a real dark room, and then you carefully load it into a camera that's bigger than this. And then you click the shutter and you go back and develop it. And you know if you got it in 10 minutes or not. Because by the time it's, it's like the whole process would take about 10 to 15 minutes from start to finish. These wet plate photos on glass. So he had confirmation of success relatively early on. Once he had a plate that was representative of the place he was documenting he would have them transported back to Washington, D.C. so the president could say, wow, we should protect these things. And so that's Carlton Watkins. And how we have some national parks. Thanks to someone who was very good at photography and very tenacious. Photography now is a smartphone. Photography then was a pack mule and 200 pounds of gear and chemicals that could kill you if you looked at them the wrong way and all sorts of stuff. So today it is far easier to be a photographer. And I think that's good because the more people that have access to a creative tool, the more we can use that tool for the good of humanity. Like if everyone has a chance to be a photographer, 
suddenly everyone can finally practice the art of photography and we can invent new things with it. I don't recall who said that, the, the concept that something can't truly be considered art until it's available for everyone to have. But that's kind of a principle of photography today, I believe. What used to be the realm of people who were wealthy, you know, it costs money to have a camera and film and all sorts of stuff. It, it's not that much money anymore to have a camera and film. You don't even need film and all that stuff. You have a smartphone, which probably has a camera you don't even need. Or you, you need the camera, but you don't need the phone. Who knows which one of the things you bought the smartphone for? Maybe you bought it because it has the best video capabilities. Like, it's a production studio in your pocket. And I like this one's kind of rounded. Okay. We can actually, we can see the chemistry moving around on the paper in this, in this one. There you go. You can see it kind of drip drip down there and now i'm going to turn it and it's not going to drip down anymore now it's going to drip sideways okay that was fun let's refocus okay uh how many we, we have 10 sheets of paper and that is a really good number I'm gonna give us a few more. You can only see seven. I'm gonna give us a few more because we have enough chemistry. So we should probably keep going. And if you ever make a lot of cyanotype chemistry, kind of like I did, and you don't know what to do with the rest of it, let's say you ran out of paper. If I ran out of paper right now and I had this much cyanotype chemistry left, I would look for some 100% natural fiber-based clothing, ideally something white, and I would make that, I would just sensitize that. You know, like a t-shirt, for example. I'm actually wearing a t-shirt right now that has popcorn on it. Like this was from a cyanotype of popcorn. And that was because I had a shirt that was able to receive the extra cyanotype chemistry I didn't use that day. And the, the trick is to get 100% cotton. Uh, this stuff requires natural fiber in order to absorb. If, if you have a polyester blend, uh, let's say it's 50-50, 50% cotton, 50% polyester, it's only going to absorb into 50% of that. It's only going to absorb into the cotton parts. So if you're going to sensitize uh, fabric with the medium of cyanotype, use 100% natural fibers and you will have a better time. I'm getting a little sloppy just because I've got enough pages and I really think that the, the fun in cyanotype for me is not in the precision or in the niceness of the paper, I think. The cyanotype fun comes from the experimenting. Just seeing what happens when you expose stuff to sunlight, that's to me the real joy. So I'm not doing a lot to keep these looking super nice. They're all for me, they're all for us. I don't need to impress anybody. I am going to coat the back of some of these papers after they're, they're drier. Like right now, some of them are dry enough that I could coat the back right now. So maybe I'll do that next. And why would I do that? Uh, so that I could have a cyanotype which has a doubly dense, in terms of its overall thickness of blue, a doubly dense exposure. Because if I make a cyanotype that's one-sided and I go to print that cyanotype, for example, I can take this image, I can take this cyanotype 
and I can put another one of these pages over it, right there. So basically, let's, let's say this is our cyanotype sheet. This is our cyanotype which we wish to copy. If I go like this, and now I leave it in the sun for several hours, the sun will move through this top paper in different ways because where it's white, it will move through fastest and allow the most light. And where it's blue, it will, it will take longer for the light to transmit through the paper. And so you'll get a copy of the image that you originally started with, but it will be inverted. So instead of a dark blue square, we would have a white square with a dark blue background if we made a copy of this image. And the reason we do two-sided cyanotypes is so that it has extra density. You know, when you get another exposure on the back, that makes this blue and that blue twice as exposure-y thickness. So it just, I don't think I'm explaining the double-sided cyanotypes very well, but if you intend to make a print from a cyanotype negative, double-sided is the way to go. That is my good sum up for the concept. Okay. So let's turn one of these over. Let's turn this, this one. This Was this our first one? No, this was not our first one. But let's do it like this. And give it a border again, yes. Because this one's got a border, so we're gonna give this one a border. There we go. Looking good, okay. Mm hmm This one's got a nice border, I like it. Okay. Okay, so now we've made a two-sided cyanotype. And we can leave this side up drying. Flip this one around, do its other side. You see I dripped some of the cyanotype onto that cyanotype, so we'll see what that does on the finished image. I don't know. It does different things every time. Yeah, these double-sided cyanotypes are excellent if you intend to make a print. So if you ever make a cyanotype and you're like, boy, I wonder what that would look like if it was inverted. You know, kind of like when you have a photographic negative and you make a print of it, you reverse. Does different things every time. And now we have a nice cloudy-ish day that we can use to our advantage to actually make these cyanotypes. And I'm gonna mute myself on the YouTube, because it's not helping me hear the reality. We've got our cyanotype set up right here. I'm going to put this right here on my desk. The camera goes there. We make sure we're streaming accurately to the world. We are. And I want to show you two things. The first I'm going to show you is this, which is a cyanotype we made on an earlier cyanotype show. This has got a um, two-sided cyanotype in front of a piece of blank cyanotype paper. So you can see right here, two-sided cyanotype, and then this is the cyanotype that is new. It's gonna go in this uh, thing that I got the other day at a store that has just general merchandise and useful things for reasonable prices. This was $3, and uh, it's for dry erase. It's for, I think it's for teachers. So you could put like a, an activity sheet here, give some kids, you know, dry erase markers, which, oh man, this is brilliant. Why wasn't I about to do this already? Um, you can just draw right on it, have your fun. Can you tell which controller this is? And then, <clears throat> same for the other. Super. 
So if this was like worksheet, you know, kids would have drawn on this and then they could be graded. Hey, you did good and you get an A, let's erase this and let someone else try. We're gonna use it for holding our cyanotype negative image on top of our fresh cyanotype sheet to make a contact print. And right now I can see this is kind of bubbling up. There's, it's not, it's not tight. Like I can see that this is raised above the paper. So I'm gonna do two things. I'm gonna add a book to the top right here. There we go. I'm gonna add a, a little book to the bottom as well. And that will equalize a little bit. And I'm not gonna add a book to, the, to, the, to this side because that's gonna get in the way of what's right here, which is another exact one of these things. And I've already got some, well, I can show you. Here is what we did. These are cookie cutters, and I basically traced them with a dry erase marker. So I put this elephant-shaped cookie cutter down on the paper, and then I took this dry erase marker, traced it, filled it in a little bit, and then I put the cookie cutter back on the sheet. I know, right? Why? I don't know yet, but we're gonna find out. Let's expose it all to some sunlight. And move it just like, Okay, like that. Okay, so now we have one, two cyanotypes going. I'm gonna make this one a little more interesting with, I think, chili pepper flakes are a good choice. I'm gonna try to only put it in areas where there isn't a uh, cookie cutter already. Like our, our velociraptor friend. Okay, there's that one. So we'll leave this uh, for 20 to 30 minutes probably. We can scoot this over a tiny bit, which means we can give this a little more leeway to expose on this side. And let us also give ourselves the favor of more room to work. So let's just go like this. And now we have all this new sun area to work with. So let us do that. Can I even zoom out more? Yes, look at that, lucky me. We have all the surface area we need. Okay, and because I am wanting to make sure that this is useful, it is still streaming, I am glad. I hear me, that's good. Okay, let's get another piece of cyanotype paper going and uh, put some of these blocks on it. These are called Kapla blocks. And uh, Kapla blocks are pretty great because they're all the same size. Each one of these blocks is the same size as each one of these other blocks, regardless of their color. I've, I've colored some of these with the cyanotype medium uh, as a fun experiment. But all these blocks that you see are equally shaped to each other. How many? Kapla blocks, does it take to make a square? I think five? It does take five. Once we have a square, what do we do with that? I don't know, but there's something enjoyable about starting with a square that, you know, you, you, you kind of, you've equalized things in a literal sense, in a, in a top is equal to side sense, and you can now start in a perfect symmetry fashion. Moving outward from there. So, we're now going to take a piece of the cyanotype paper we just made, right here. We'll do full size, put it on a, a box top, put these here, and let's take our square. Mm. And now let's figure out how far to put it in from the center because this, there we go, I like that. Okay. So we're only doing this so that we can figure out where the paper center is. Uh, I've, I've not ever thrown clay pots besides seventh grade creative mixed media class, 
but I believe that they do need to center the clay on the wheel before they move forward from shaping it. You don't need to center your cyanotype designs. It's just this method we're doing this time. So once we know where the center is, we can build out. And we do now know where the center is. So let's add some things in a slightly patterned way. And if you notice a pattern forming, um, that's awesome. I bet it's somewhat similar to the pattern I had in my mind. Because the fact is, there are a lot of patterns at any given moment, and I bet a lot of them go unnoticed. Maybe patterns themselves are you know, made up. Everything has a pattern on a long enough time scale, it's just we don't always get to hear it repeat to prove that it was a pattern. And we're getting a little bit of ambient light while we do this, and that is okay. We've already put some things on the paper, so we've already secured that there are pure white parts of this paper underneath the blocks. Everything else that's gradually exposing, like this little bit right here, that is just fine. See, now I just set myself up for something I can't duplicate. I can't put another one like this here because the ridge of the box is infringing on my ability to do that. So I'm just going to have to make that a thing that we do only on the lefts and the rights. But nope, not even that one. Because look how much it pushed that one inward. So now we're going to have to adjust to compensate. Who would have thought putting a bunch of blocks on paper took any level of precision? Monks, they would have thought this. They do this kind of thing with sand, and that's a lot smaller than planks of wood. Okay. And I kind of like to leave little gaps around the vertical, the upright ones. That way it gives them a chance to make a shadow that goes in ways I can't anticipate. And we'll keep just adding little interesting things like that until the paper's pretty full and we no longer know how to, how to embellish it, really. That's what this is. None of these are... None of these things we're doing are obvious or necessary. You know, this is how we're deciding to craft this reality. Which, which pieces intersect with which pieces is the only thing we need to decide. I can intersect with my beverage. This beverage has little bears on it with crowns. It's called the Bear's Ears, which when you see it written, kind of looks like beer's ears. Kind of like the bee's knees. Okay, there we go. And now we have, we have a semblance of order and logic and some of the exposures already started so we might as well open this up. But I wanna do one thing first and that is to lift one of these blocks back up. Let's lift this one. There we go. And then let's lift this one, Tambien, also. There we go. And now let's lift this middle one as well. Might have to lift one out of the way and then pick that one up. Luckily, they're all decently easy to do that too. They all kind of lift on their own they pivot on their own axis very well. All right. Let us open the window again and let the sun shine in. Yeah, there we go. Okay. It's so bright. There we go. Now we can add additional layers on top. And again, we just follow 
follow our heart's logic. What do we think is right? Where should it go? Etc. And then some of these, it's, it's not the easiest thing to see, but some of these have already left a permanent shadow of their place where they were. So I'm just gonna close the window real quick again and you're gonna get to see right here. I'll lift it on up, I'll bring it up to you. There we go. See those little, the parts that look gray blue are the parts where the sun is exposed and the parts that look light green, lime green, yellow green, those are the parts that are in shade this whole time. So they have not received any sun exposure. Now I'm just gonna line the shadows back up the way they were. There we go. And now I'm just gonna blast them with the light again. I even turned it a different way this time. That'll be fun to see the results of. Okay, well now I can do, I can give this a little more time. I'm gonna go like that to make it, is, is, was it Quail Man's Call? No. And now I'm just gonna let this kind of expose where this block that is upright is perpendicular to the sun and it's in that it's going straight towards the sun and those sun's rays are parallel with the way the shadow is. Those are two conventions of totally legitimate nature but both equally made up, you know. Something hitting something perpendicular and parallel is all just imaginary when we really don't even see it happening. We don't know what it's like to travel in a light ray in parallel with this block of wood. I don't know. We're all creatures of light. And I'm gonna make sure the stream is still functional. It is, I'm so glad. Now I'm going to keep turning this and that's going to keep giving us some different shadow, I don't know what, some different shadows. And then the thing we're going to take a cyanotype of next will be this abacus because it's pretty cool looking too. So we might as well start that one now too. Let's take a look at the way we can make the abacus shadow. So I'm going to hold it here and we're going to look at it here because that's actually what's going to be the cyanotype. How do we want it to look? Ooh, okay. Oh, yeah, they were. Oh, we found it. We found our angle. We're going to make a diamond. Yes, we're going to make a diamond shape on the paper. And we can adjust these little guys. How do they look best? They look good like that. 
But what happens if we go like this and then like that and then like this? How does that look? Well, that looks interesting, but I don't think it looks good. Let's do this. Uh, the same. Let's just do random, because I think that's always a better choice when you don't know what to do. And then, cool. Okay. <laughs> Then we're going to have to shorten it just a little bit because we don't have quite enough paper to uh, fit. Well, I don't know, actually. Let's take a look. Let's do a test. How do we fit everything on there? We do it like that. Like that. Okay. We're going to embellish it too. These are halfway here to hold the paper down and halfway here just to give it some visual interest. Because I, I don't know what this is going to look like. I think we might end up putting, putting something on the paper, like maybe some coins to see if we can add that, that extra to it. And then have we given this a full turn? Let's give it this full turn. There we go. Coins, I know where coins are. They're in the little change container. Okay, hey, the first coin I found was my dad's token, Ito. It's nice and easy to put these kind of exactly on the circle because all you have to do is line up the shadow with the shadow of the coin. a very novel abacus that uses literal money. And our other cyanotypes, like that one and this one, they're all doing exactly what they need to be doing. And then I'm pretty sure when we're finished with these cyanotypes today, I'm going to put them, if they look good and they look something like, I would say, you could put that on a wall and be proud of it. Uh, if they look like that, I'm going to put them on lightprintpaper.com so that they can be purchased and then put on your wall. Because I have a box. I have many boxes of these. I don't want more of them. I would love for them to find their way into the world and onto someone's meaningful life shelf. Okay, that's looking good. I like the tilting effect. It's, it reminds me of a video I just watched about relativity and how different time frames of reference are all valid. They just different, different distortions cause some people to think something is happening at a non 
time other than now. Like Interstellar, when Matthew McConaughey travels too close to a black hole and ages a hundred years, 70 years due to the excessive gravity. And then he comes back to Earth and, well, he doesn't come back to Earth. He comes back to the, to our sun system, the soul system, and uh, meets his now 90 plus year old daughter, even though Matthew McConaughey himself is only 45. Because time dilation is very real and its, its effects are observable. We usually don't get to observe them on humans at an aging level, but it's a real thing. Anyway, this diagonal slanting reminded me of that. Two frames of reference just need to be adjusted appropriately and they can be parallel with each other again. Okay, and now I think we can take off a few of these just to give it some more, or we'll just change them like that. Same for this. Oh, can't move that one because that block is on it. Well, no, I can. I can move that one. I was tempted to put the rest of these coins onto this cyanotype, but I like it best when we don't mix too many different uh, textures and shapes. I feel like the eye can make better sense of things where it's a set of shapes repeated and just orchestrated different contrasts rather than a whole lot of shapes the brain's got to disseminate and then understand what they're looking at. Tempting to want to move these, which I guess I can with relative impunity. There we go. And then which other one will I move? That one. No, that one's fine. That one. No, I can't. This is harder than it looks. There we go. Nope, that was wrong too. There we go. Wow, that was, that was way way trickier than I was expecting to figure out. <laughs> How to move each of these vertical lines to get them to show up horizontally on the paper. Okay, and we can probably get away with adjusting this like that. And then we can do the same thing underneath it. There we go. Now, oh, I just got some sweat on this cyanotype. So that's going to start the development on wherever the sweat fell. So that's fun. If you want to watch, it's happening right there. Because these all will be developed using water when we're all done. We'll just, we'll just dunk them in some water and we'll see how they turn out. Okay, so now we can turn it like that. I think that's going to add a nice dimensionality. We'll get rid of these, this. Well, let's see, do we have more? Yeah, we have more. Let us... Oh, 
There's a lovely breeze blowing through here. We are so lucky to be getting that. Ah, yes. This one can be done, so let's take it and we'll just move it away for, for now. It can be over there. And now we've got a new cyanotype opening. I found this bottle that I think is going to make a really neat cyanotype. Let's, I put some water in it so that way it's thick and it won't roll too much hopefully. And let's just, let's see, I think it'll be good. Let's make it kind of a diagonal like that. There we go. Okay. Now we just need to find a piece of paper, cyanotype paper, to put underneath. And then we are good. So let's do that. Okay. There it is. That one is going to be a really basic cyanotype. And that is okay. We can keep turning this one. I've kind of forgotten the way we turned it originally, so let's just, just keep turning it in general until it gives us a sense of satisfaction that we're complete. Get rid of these and this. They've done their job. Now let's remove one of these blocks and this block, but we'll put it right back here. And then we can lower this block and we can't lower that block. So let's not lower that block. There we go. Let's see. So, you know, we're just continuing to turn this until we feel that we've turned it as much as it can be turned and then we decide it's done.
keep turning until it's pretty much finished and then we'll then we'll be able to develop these. Okay, I think this this one's done. Let's remove the abacus. We got the coins alone. And we can remove the coins. Cool, that's done. We'll put this on the finished pile. Let's do one final cyanotype. And let's not try very hard. Let's do this. Boom! That one reminds me of the Milky Way spiral arms. Which kind of sounds like a galactic bed and breakfast. The Milky Way spiral arms. Okay, so now I'm gonna take this. I'm going to lift the paper up, put the bottle right on the other side of it and then flip it like this. And now we're gonna start the exposure again and see what, we, what it is. Because it's all an experiment. So I would say we're looking at another 10 minutes for this one, five minutes till this is done. This one, we can go like this, move it up into the sun a little more. Thank you books, very useful. I'm just removing a few of these blocks at a time to see what pattern gets created as a result. It's not, it's not according to any real plan. Today's sunlight is actually quite diffused. It's, it's, not, it's not a strong sunlight. It's coming through a lot of clouds that look almost rain filled. They're not, but they're almost rain filled. So this is actually a longer exposure than we would typically have for a piece of cyanotype paper. But that's okay. There's still plenty of UV light in those cloudy sunlight rays. And that is the thing that actually creates the chemical change on this paper. It's ultraviolet light that causes the reaction that turns this from a light yellow color to a dark matte gray color. And while that's happening, it is creating a chemical change that is also going to leave a dark blue color wherever the sun exposed on the paper. 
And uh, dark blue is also sometimes called cyan, hence cyanotype. Let's turn this 45 degrees for fun. And I'm glad you can be here for today, although I'm literally looking at the YouTube watch metrics and I see that no one is currently viewing this live stream, but someone may be joining in the future and I'm glad they have. turn one more time this paper until this canister is there we go just like that Oh, perfect. Made that decision. Remove the ones that fell. Now we can keep turning this for fun.
All right, well, these are looking pretty good. So there's not much left to do, but leave a few more minutes of exposure and then we develop them. We have one, two, three, four, and then there are two more over there. So five, six cyanotypes that we've made today. One of them is a double-sided cyanotype. That's pretty neat. And keep turning this. There's that shade. See the a uniform distribution of light suddenly? Ooh, a Canadian coin. Or maybe that was an actual penny? I think that might have been an English penny. Nineteen ninety five, DG Reg, Elizabeth. One penny. Okay, so we'll leave the penny on there and we'll pick up some cents. That's good. Everyone needs more sense after all. This is done. And I'm gonna prepare our water, which is just basically a tub with some tap water in it. filling up a tub right now with some water right out of the sink and I'm going to bring it over to our cyanotype in just a moment and we're going to develop them and we develop our cyanotypes it's basically just plunging them into a bath of water that's all there is to it so now we can do it boom let's close this because we don't want direct sunlight 
while we develop. All right, now let's see what this looks like. Okay, looks pretty neato. Let's see. See what this one looks like. Okay, not much. So we're not going to develop this one. There's plenty more we can do with this, but we have a baseline exposure now because we exposed some of this onto this. So this will be fun to play with later, but we're not going to do anything with it. We're going to put it away. Okay, how about this? Let's take all these items. Put them in here. Okay. Okay, let's take our, our coin cyanotype and let's expose slash develop that. I like it. It's got a lot of things happening. Let's do another one. Let's do the bottle. This was our two-sided cyanotype. I believe this was the first side. See this one. I'll let these all speak for themselves because you can see just what I can too. So I don't need to say what I think about these.
let's check out our abacus. Well, that one's pretty cool too. That's right, I wasn't gonna say what I thought. But it's too late. There's a Pokeball. Okay, we have one final cyanotype to check, and that is this one, which had all the things. So let's take the cookie cutters off. And then I'm gonna go dump the chili pepper flakes into the trash can for safety of all parties. Now we can take this out, see what the actual cyanotype looks like. It's definitely interesting. Let's develop it. developing very nicely. This is my first attempt at coloring the cookie cutter shapes in with a dry erase marker. So that was a fun experiment. Tape these around a little bit just to give them a chance to all be seen. I'm now going to Take these cyanotypes and just dump the rest of this water out into the sink and replace it with some fresh water. Just taking a look at our cyanotype hall over here in the shade before I bring it back over. It's all looking real nice. We got some good exposures and some strong contrast and I'm very happy that we got all these done today. I'm so glad you made the time to be here for this. Or maybe you fast forward to this moment 
in the archive. And that was a good choice too. Everyone can relive every moment of this day if they choose. Because it's all been documented. Some of these might take a little longer to wash than a regular piece of paper because as you saw at the beginning of this video, we coated these with a lot of chemistry and that makes them a lot longer to develop. So we are reaping what we have sown and then some. this guy here this was our cyanotype thing and we can just erase that and then theoretically we're ready to to do more with it That's good enough. Yep, there's a little bit more development still happening because I can still see some trace yellow amounts in the water. That means it's not fully developed yet. This one is. So I'm going to I'm going to take this one, put it right there and I'm going to bring a screen so we can let it air dry. So I just put it on this window screen and then I'll let it drip dry a little bit and then we can put it right here. We'll go rinse these because they pretty much are done. I'm going to give them one, one more tiny bath. That'll make them real happy.
Well, these are going to be developing for a little bit longer, so I'm not going to make you hang around for that. Let's say we had a very successful set of cyanotype developing, and I think we're about done. So thank you for being here. This has been excellent. Let's zoom out for context and clarity and to see what kind of mess we did or did not make. Looks pretty good. Thank you for making cyanotypes with me. I think I'm going to put that one and that one and I don't know. Maybe some of these will be available later on lightprintpaper.com.